started here in just a moment.
good. And my heart is breaking because he's telling me that there are people who are saying, where is the goodness of God in this situation? Where is the goodness looking for something on the outside rather than looking at the God on the inside who is goodness? And God wants you to know that no matter what's going on, no matter how rough it seems, like you're living in a sandpaper world, that he is good. His thoughts toward you are good. His actions toward you, for you, and in the situation are for your good and the good of those around you. And even though you don't see the end yet, in the end, it will be good if you continue to claim the goodness of God is yours. Open your mouth, say it continuously, no matter what the circumstances are. God, you are good, and you are good in my life. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you.
so thankful for your spirit to come. Thank you, Lord. It's good to just be still. As as we were worshiping, I could hear the Lord say, come, come, leave your burdens here with me, come. Come to the waters, the living waters. Come quickly, for I will take on those burdens. You need to learn to rest in me. Come to me and give me those burdens. They are not meant for you to carry. Come and lay them at my feet. For my child, I did not want you to carry those things. Give them to me. I have already taken them when I was on the cross. Do not carry those things. Come to me quickly and leave them with me.
I don't know how many of you have heard what's going on in Israel, but it's pretty bad. Um, I, on my phone, I have an app, and every time Israel gets hit with a rocket, a missile, it goes bing, 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 like that. The other night we were out to dinner with some friends, and it just kept going and going. I'm, I'm like, something's going on in Israel, and it's not good. And we found out later that there were over 6,000 rockets shot into Israel. Do you want to tell the story of what's going on? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Latest estimates are that over 2,000 people in Israel have been wounded. Over 500 of them are dead and over a hundred of them have been captured. And uh, that doesn't seem like it's gonna end up being a very good thing for them. And um, we talked to uh, Scott last, Pastor Scott last night, and uh, he asked if Glenn and I would get up here and, and ask you all to join in prayer for Israel. You know, they're like our older brother. They are the physical Israel we are the spiritual Israel, but we need to stand together right now, and they really need us. Well, yeah, Netanyahu, their prime minister, has declared war, so it's not going to be pretty. Not all the world uh, agrees with Israel, so right now we're just having to pray that our our leadership in this country will, in fact, stand by him. Lord, I just, I really want to pray for that nation. I pray for your people. We pray that you would cover them, protect them, bless them, Lord, and help them defeat their enemies. Lord, you, thousands of years you've been doing it, so we pray it again. We want to stand together with them and cry out to you for your mercy in this time. Lord, deliver them from the evil ones. Uh, it's so bad that this morning I heard a, a Muslim brother condemning what was going on. Lord, you know. So just, just put your hands over, put your arms around your children, your people, Lord, your called ones, protect them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. The original message for some of you were probably getting excited. We were going to be in Exodus 29. And uh, during worship, just felt like we needed to take a, uh, a right turn. Um, the, the essence of the message is going to be the same. It's just going to be from a different text. Um, as I've been praying for this congregation, the, the phrase that came to my heart was the depths of worship. And the, the impression that I had on my heart as I was talking to the Lord is the temptation to back off of going deep in God, the temptation to, whether it be pain or the busyness of life, or uh, just the mundane, take your foot off the accelerator and just kind of coast. And I feel there's an invitation to this community to press through, to go to the depths of worship, to go to the depths of praise, to go to the depths of really contending and cultivating uh, depth of worship in your life. And um, to that end, we're going to look at Ephesians 3. And we're going to begin in verse 14. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ian Rutherford. I'm the director of the Three Rivers House of Prayer here in Longview, Washington. We currently are on the campus of Longview Community Church in Gebert Chapel. It's the Little Stone Chapel next to that large behemoth of a building. And uh, Longview Community Church has been very gracious to us, very kind. Uh, Dave Hendrickson there has really got a kingdom mentality, much like what your pastor here does, Pastor Scott, and um, has let us settle in and worship. We've been there over a year, and um, this will be our eighth year in the city. I can't believe it. Isn't that amazing? Eight years in Longview. Of course, the, the uh, Three Rivers House of Prayer has been functioning since 2007, but We've been full-time directors of that ministry uh, beginning in 2015, and we're, we're making the turn into our eighth year. It's, it's beautiful. Well, let's pray together, and, and we can jump in. Holy Spirit, we can read, we can study, we can contemplate, but until, until that spirit of revelation touches our heart, we're barren. So Lord, I ask you for a spirit of revelation to rest on our hearts. That we would be illumined by your Holy Spirit. That we would come into understanding. That we would come into an ever-deepening worship and an ever-deepening connection with who you are. Lord, I pray that you would bring light to the scripture, that words on a page would become living understanding in our hearts and that we would enter in together. Lord, every moment is precious because you're precious. Let this be a time to sit under your word, to sit under your presence, to sit under your throne. And enjoy the authority, the power, the light of your glory. God, together, together we say with the Old Testament blessing, let the light of your face shine upon us. Oh, we need the bright countenance of your face to bathe our spirit. To enjoy the Father's face looking and gazing and shining the radiance of your countenance upon us. In Jesus' name. Well, if you're a student of the Bible, you know the book of Ephesians in general is broken up into two major parts. The first part being orthodoxy, the right way to think and feel about the Lord. And the latter part of the book is orthopraxy, how you might practice or begin to initiate in your life what God looks like. And here in Ephesians chapter 3, we're right at that apex, we're right at that turn, if you will, between what we think about God, 
or what God thinks about us and how then we would begin to live. And there's this beautiful prayer, we call them the apostolic prayers of the Bible. There's this beautiful prayer that Paul writes in order to really begin to put a grip or put a pin so that those two ideas come together. That what we think about God or what God is like and how we should live are joined together in this beautiful, this beautiful prayer. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, for this reason, I'm reading from the ESV. I believe the words that you'll see on the screen are New King James. That's my fault, not their fault. I, uh, I know you guys are a King James community, but ESV is my, <laughs> ESV is my sword, so just bear with me. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you would be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner man, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, as we said, this is a linchpin verse or a linchpin couple verses that bring these two ideas together. And if you were a student of the Bible, if you had read the first couple chapters, you would realize that Paul has interrupted himself several times. In other words, as we look at the beginning of verse 14, it says, for this reason, the immediate question is, Paul, what reason? Paul, what what are you referring to? Well, if we backed the train up a little bit, we would look at the verse 1 of chapter 3, and we would see that phrase again. For this reason. Well, Paul, you have interrupted yourself twice. Where are you going? What, What reason is there to pray this prayer. Well, we could even back up further to chapter 2, verse 11, and we would read, therefore, remember. Well, when we see a therefore, and I know you guys are good Bible students, when we see a therefore, we ask the question, what is it there for? Great job, guys. I'm proud of you. Well, we're going to roll all the way back up to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this not of your own doing, but a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul is looking at the core of the gospel in Ephesians 2 verse 7. And he's saying at the end of the day, God is manufacturing, God is forming in you like a craftsman, a work of grace. And that grace is from God's heart himself. I loved the testimony this morning it's not that God does good it's that God is good it's not that God performs grace it's that he is full of grace it's his substance it's his essence and that when he looked at us as those who have been estranged and living far from him as objects of wrath he looked at his adversaries and said I will choose to bestow upon you my grace And I will make a way for you to draw near, to come into my presence and to be my children, to be my people. And so he sacrificed his son. He took the very essence of who he is, crushed it in our place so that the enmity between man and God would come to nothing and that the favor of God could rest on us as a people. It's beautiful 
Our gospel is beautiful. It's truly the only good news in the world. Right? It's the only eternal hope. It's the only thing that we can really pin our hopes on. It's the person of God. How, how uh, in any other context, in any other circumstance, the gospel would be a fairy tale. The gospel would be something to laugh at. The gospel would be something that we would write maybe on the back of a newspaper. But because God eternal is involved in it, it's ironclad, it's sure, it's firm, it's, with, it's immovable and it's without variation. That God likes us, that God likes us is what we're putting all of our life into. And if God has any variation, if God has any shadow, any seam, any stitch, if somehow he doesn't work and feel perfectly, that concept that God likes us would be the folly of the world. But because God is who he is, we can look at him, love him, look him straight into the essence of who he is and say, all of my life for the revelation that you like me. That your grace is for me. That you favor me above all things. That you favor me even above your son. I, who was an adversary of God, was shown favor greater than that of your son. You crushed him that you could love me. And so when we turn the, the, the car, so to speak, when we start looking into Ephesians 3.14, and it says, for this reason, we're gripped by this profound idea. We're gripped by this profound reality that God is bringing His whole self, His very grace, His very favor to our life. And Paul is saying it's profound, it's heavy. There's the, the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word for glory was kabod. It's heavy, it's got weight to it. There's a weightiness. Under the weightiness of God's glory, we bow down, right? They went low to survive, not to be reverent. Are you hearing me? The kabod of God rested on them, and they said, I have to go low. This is weighty. Well, beloved, this is weighty. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, verse 16, the riches of his glory, the glory of God is inexhaustible. The glory of God will continue for eternity. If you would imagine a candle, eventually it would die out because there's no more wax. If you would imagine a nuclear power plant, eventually it would grow cold because the fuel would be exhausted. If you're imagining the sun, there will be a day the sun ends because it's created in all of its heat and in all of its explosion in all of what it provides for the universe, there will be a day it ends. But beloved, the glory of God will never end because God will never end. He was, He is, and He is to come. There's no beginning, there's no end. His glory radiates from Himself, much like the testimony this morning that He's good. It's the essence of who He is. He doesn't acquire it to put it on. He doesn't fashion it to wear it. It comes out of his innermost being, and it's the glory of God. It's the brightness of his countenance. It's the illumination of the universe. The, the transcendence of what we enjoy of him is his glory. The riches of his glory. Have you plumbed the depths of his glory? Have you gone somewhere with it? 
Would you dare to explore and get lost in it? I heard a a terrible idea. I heard a very convicting idea about the human spirit related to boredom. Boredom, when we experience boredom, we have come to the end of our soul and there's nothing left to be fascinated with. In other words, boredom is a condition of our own inability to worship. Boredom means our soul is small and doesn't contain a glory or an interest that would keep us occupied. And so we turn to frivolity and trivialities and entertainment because there's that eternal quality is missing from our life. Well, guys, we have the Father of all glory. We have the treasury of heaven himself, the Father radiating. We read from the scripture in Revelation that light and fire emanate. It says one like a son of man. We don't know, is it a son of man? Is it what kind of form or shape But in it is glory and light and fire burning eternally. That there's thunder and lightning moving around the throne. There's this energy about him that is eternal. He's never tired. He's never exhausted. He's never worn out. He's never seen a problem he can't solve. He's never faced an issue that is perplexing. In every way, he dominates the universe. It's his very will. It's his very conscious thought that keeps breath in your lungs. This is the Father of glory. This is the one who has the riches of glory in him. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in your inner man. Can you imagine your spirit is a conduit, your soul is a conduit through which all of that glory is meant to come through? It's this massive, beautiful, fiery, living light. And by the purchase of your soul in the Ephesians 2-7 paradigm, Because I want you to understand that your salvation was a true salvation. You didn't get saved to be survivable. Right? Don't you find it interesting, by the way, so many of our entertainment scenarios, whether it's Marvel or some of the dystopian like fantasies, there's survivability is the great triumph, right? Right? I just want to say no in Jesus' name. I'm not here to survive. I'm here to thrive. God didn't save me to just get by. God didn't save me to give kind of that white knuckle somehow with God I'm going to get by. No, that's not our inheritance. I do believe life is hard. I'm not minimizing anyone's struggle Nor am I saying that somehow you're less than if you're like, I'm in a bad spot. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, the reference for my life is the wealth of God's glory, not the depravity of the world, and not the strength of my own soul. The reference point for my life is God's glory. And when I tap into it, I tap into an eternal treasure an eternal power, an eternal glory that works through me to strengthen me. Deep in my inner man, and this is part of what I feel for you guys, there is a depth for this community. There is a depth of experience in God's glory that is yours. And I want to say with all gentleness, it's not the charismatic hoopla of a good meeting. I like that stuff, by the way. It's in the kitchen when you're crying. 
It's at the bedside when you don't have an answer. Right? It's when you're reconciling your pocketbook and you go, I don't know how this is happening. That's where you need His glory. It's in the community saying, how do we move forward? That's where God's glory wants to strengthen you. Do we want a hyped up meeting? It's nice. It's good. God's presence is good. We should celebrate him for his presence and for what he does. He's still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still the God of light and glory that makes our faces shine. But beloved, the strength of your life in his glory is to go to the depths of where you're at. To go to the depths of where you're at. I find it interesting in uh, Exodus 29, it was the innermost parts of the animal that were sacrificed to the Lord. The outer parts of the animal at least with the, uh, with the guilt offering, were taken outside of the camp and burned. He only wanted the innermost parts. The fat around the, the intestines, the fat around the liver, it was that that was put on the altar that made a beautiful aroma and a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. Beloved, the strength of God, the strength of God's glory is the enablement for us to offer our innermost parts to the Lord. The strength of God's glory to crack us open, to say yes. It's that involuntary yes to God's glory, right? Anyone else who would say, no, thank you. But having seen and experienced the glory of God, we would say, it's only right and appropriate that the depths of my heart be offered to you. I want that for you as an advocate for your community, as a friend of this congregation, I want that for you. I want it for you when you're hurting. And I know you're hurting. I want it for you when you're scared. And I know you're scared. I want it for you when you're reaching for the Lord like you did this morning in worship. It's beautiful. The glory of God that uncreated light and substance. Psalm 36, in your light, we see light. Are you kidding me? What's in it that we would experience it? It's an encounter. It's a substance called the glory of God. It has the residue of himself in it. If you have been purchased, and you have. If you have been justified, and you have. If you have been sanctified and washed by his blood, and you have, this glory is yours. This glory is yours to be strengthened. This glory of yours is to reach deep into your inner man. To be a provision when life is hard, to be an anchor when life is great. He wants to strengthen your inner man. He wants to reach deep in there and create a buoyancy and a light and a, an ability to rise up over your circumstances. Those who wait on the Lord will be strengthened. They will be as eagles that fly. Right? It's not that somehow the storm, the winds of the storm abate. It's that you have the wings to fly through them. It's not that the waves of the storm lessen. It's that you have a buoyancy to stay on top and not be buried by them. That's the kind of strength that the glory of God provides for you. I know there's questions, I know there's a sense of anxiety. I can feel it, but I want to tell you God is stronger. God is more able. God is able in every way to keep that which you have committed to him. Your very soul can be strengthened by the glory of God. Amen. 
through his spirit in your innermost being. Well, I love that last phrase, through his spirit. Here's what I want to say to you. We think of strength like working out with like dead weights, right? If you lift enough weight, you'll get stronger. It's true. If I know enough information at work, I'll be a stronger employee, right? If I acquire this much finances, I'll have this ability to be strengthened. Beloved, the strength is in relation to an encounter with a person called the Holy Spirit. Intimacy with the Lord. Intimacy with the Lord. Spending time with Him. Getting to know Him. Gazing at Him. You know, it works the same way as it does with people. I know a handful of you in the congregation, and I can say with a smile, I'm glad I do. Right? There's a couple of people in town, I'm not sure that I do. <laughs> but would I know you just by your face? I might know your name. I might say, oh yeah, from, long, you know, from that church. But until I sit down with you and hear your story hear your laugh, see your tears, share something of where you're at, the substance of the relationship is pretty thin. Right? There is a world behind each of your faces that's beautiful. There is a world behind each of your lives that is glorious. The struggles are real and painful. The victories are sweet and glorious. But behind each of those faces is this entire paradigm of life that's meant to be known and enjoyed. Well, it works with the Holy Spirit that way. You can know his name. You know, you can even do a little Shundai Mahundai and have some tongues with him. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about. I know you guys. <laughs> but it's when you sit down with him and you cry with him and you laugh with him and you share with him that the substance of intimacy actually begins to strengthen you. Right? It's how a marriage works. It's how your covenant with the Lord works. It's how it's going to work with the Holy Spirit. It's how you develop friendship with a human. The same is true with friendship with God. Now, I'm not minimizing the glory of our relationship with the Lord. I'm saying the principle is the same. Oh, I exhort you, get away with him. That strength, that strength that you long for, will be found in intimacy with Christ through his spirit, through his spirit. It's not an inanimate object that you can apply. It's not a fulcrum that you can pull. It's a person to know. So that Christ might be might dwell in your hearts through faith. I'm beginning in 17. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. What a cryptic phrase. What a cryptic phrase. I mean, you could read over that and go, wow, that's cool. What does that mean? Simply this. That the character and quality of Christ might actually form in you. Now, we know from John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, that Jesus or Christ was the Word made flesh. Correct? Okay, here's what I want to say to you. In like kind, but lesser measure, every believer follows that pattern. The Word of God is planted in your heart. It is formed inside of you, and then you manifest it in the flesh. You are the word made flesh in that, in that what you know of God, what you know of his eternal truth is formed in you so that you can then go manifest it in the earth. 
And we need that, don't we? Not just for salvation, not just for the lost world. You need it in your midst. Patience, kindness, gentleness, compassion, love. There's a handful in you here this morning. You feel roughed up. It's hard. You need the word made flesh in your neighbor coming to you, loving on you, taking you aside. Community with our neighbor begins with community with God. Community with your neighbor begins with your community with God. You don't have community with God. You will not have community with your neighbor. And Christ being formed inside of you, you become an answer for the tears of your neighbor across the, the aisle. You become an answer for your neighbor who's having anxiety. You actually have a capacity to withstand it. Now, I know you because I know myself. There's a handful of problems that I just kind of just kind of move away from, right? I just want to tell you with all certainty, God always moves towards a problem. Man will always find a way to move away. When Christ is formed in you, there is a capacity to look at an issue and take a step towards it. To look it full in the eye and have maybe not the answer, but an answer even in your presence. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. In the very last phrase of Psalm of uh, verse 19, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I want to give you the punchline, and then because I know you're a good Berean people, you're going to read back and you're going to do your own research, okay? Because I only have one Sunday with you. The fullness of your life and the fullness of God find each other in love. And the beautiful discovery of life is what God what love looks like in God the heights the depths the width there's an ocean of affection that will sustain you and grow you into the person you're supposed to be into the community that you're supposed to be it won't be through great evangelistic zeal although that's good it won't be through depth of the knowledge of, God, of the Word of God, although that's important. It will actually be in your encounter with the love of God. A love-centered identity is the inheritance of every believer. And for so many of us, at the center of our identity is something other than love. Performance. Accomplishment disappointment, fear, uncertainty, a wild commitment to safety. Love is not safe. Love does not feel the burden to perform. That flame of love that is at the center of God is meant to be at the center of your identity. And that is where the fullness of your life will come. The fullness of God's life in you will grow and develop in context to that paradigm of love becoming the center of who you are. And I want to say you, to you without, without hesitancy, you were made for love. You were made to live in and be enjoyed by God. That's your inheritance in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul is praying that you be strengthened. 
That's why Paul is praying that you would encounter the glory of God. He's referencing again all the way back to that initial salvation of going, hey, Ephesians 2.7 is real. And it comes with a huge package called God that as you encounter him, this idea of surviving will turn into a paradigm of thriving. But he's saying at the end of the day, the way God is centered in love, God's people will be centered in love. And that's the door, that's the, that's the reality, the pipeline to the fullness of your life. What does the fullness of life look like? I, mm, this one is, this one's convicting. It's not money. It's not even health. It's God himself. Let me just run through a couple paradigms for you. Um, But I want you to reconcile yourself to this thought. When Israel left Egypt, when they left bondage, God brought them to Sinai to meet with him. God's first thought for his people, having come out of 400 years of slavery, was to be intimate with him on a mountain. In other words, God thought he was enough. Okay, I'm poking. I know I'm poking. I want you to be with me here. I want you to understand this. God thought he was enough. David, in Psalm 27, with Jerusalem surrounded, with his mother and father abandoning him, with the imminent collapse of his kingdom in the psalm, says one thing. One thing I seek in verse 4. Then in verse 9 and 10, he says, You have said to me, Seek my face. Your face, O Lord, will I seek. David, as a king, thought God was enough. Jesus goes to the cross. He could have appealed to any number of authorities. He could have appealed to the Roman government. He could have appealed to his own government. He could have appealed to his apostles, rise up, take over, lead a rebellion. He could have appealed to anyone. But in the depths of Gethsemane, he thought God was enough. Not my will, O God, but yours be done. Fulfilling, incidentally, Psalm 16, verse 4, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. He knew that if he obeyed to the point of death, resurrection power would be his. Okay. We talked about the depth of worship, right? We talked about offering our innermost parts to the Lord very briefly, but the whole point of today is to get to this paradigm that God is searching and God has given you an enablement to cultivate and to provide a context in which that sweet aroma of worship can be offered to the Lord. I want to ask you, is God enough? If the stalls are empty, and there's no grain in the field, will praise for God be enough? And I'm not throwing it down as a challenge. I'm not saying it with hype. I'm saying it with gentleness. You guys need to answer this question. Is God himself enough for you?
God has provided his glory for you to encounter so that you can say yes to that question. God has provided a means by which you can get a hold of him and more importantly, he can get a hold of you that a love-centered identity rooted in gratitude can be your inheritance so that no matter what the storm, high or low, no matter what the blessing, high or low, God can say, I see a man who believes, or a woman, I'm enough. I'm enough. Let's uh, maybe just have some worship, if we can. It can be live, or it can just be piped in, I don't care. Just close your eyes for a second. Thank you, Mom. Well, maybe it's offering the innermost parts of your heart in the context of pain. Maybe it's offering your heart in the context of success. Maybe these words are new to you and the sense of invitation is new. Maybe there's some in the room that said, I remember a season where the depths of my heart were the priority. Just begin to talk to him right now. Holy Spirit, I ask you that all over the room you would make known the riches of God's glory. That as we focus on you and look to you, maybe it's an inch, maybe it's a mile, but you would begin to move us closer to a love-centered identity. This morning, we renounce the burden of performance. This morning, we renounce the burden of shame and fear. We declare, we agree with the gospel. We're enough. We're enough for you. I'm enough for you. In my little, in my lack, I'm enough. Equipped with that knowledge, I want to offer the depths of my heart to you. I want to offer my pain. I want to offer my fear. I want to offer my good. I want to offer my best and I want to offer my worst. don't want to hold back. Strengthen me with your glory. Strengthen me with your glory.
strengthen me with your glory. Maybe it's a sense of disappointment. Maybe you feel like you're a disappointment. Maybe there's an outcome in life that you, it just hasn't been settled. You just can't get over a sense of failure or inadequacy. The Lord says, I love you. I'm enough. Thank you, Jesus. This word that Ian is bringing to us today is a word from the Lord. Here's what uh, the Lord has given me as uh, out of Second Peter chapter one, verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, through the personal knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his great and precious promises so that through them we may become partakers of his divine nature in other words God living through you and me and that is the goal that is exactly the call of the the prodigal. There are so many prodigals in this community and the Lord is drawing them back. The wounded warriors, those who have been injured by religion, by misunderstandings, by lack of communication, by breakdowns in relationships this way and that. The Lord is He's pouring out a spirit of reconciliation and restoration to the community here. I believe beyond the whole world. In the season that we're entering into, it's a spirit of reconciliation. So the prodigals coming home, the prodigals returning to that which the Lord has showed to them who they are. This is about identity. It's understanding that Jesus lives inside of you. He lives inside of those who he has, who they have sidelined themselves. And I heard the enemy say this to me. He says, he, the enemy has tried to, to uh, convince you that you have been disqualified that you are disqualified by your behavior, by your thought patterns, and by what you have done. But this is what I hear the Lord say. He says, all of that is broke off. And, they, and he says to the enemy, thus far and no more. Thus far and no more. It's a new beginning. It's a time to recognize who you are because Christ lives in you. He is the hope of your glory. Christ inside of you. When we line up with that thought process, there is freedom, there is liberty, and we can move on from the past that has held us bondage to where we are now, where we are seated with him in the high places. So thank you, Father. Lord, right now in Jesus' name, Lord, we just thank you for this word of deliverance that's been brought to us, a word of of. of revelation father of who you are what you have done and who we now are because of it father and i thank you for that jesus thank you lord amen Lord, I ask for your people. I ask that you shine the light of your face upon them. Lord, I ask that you would be gracious to them. You would provide peace for them. 
whose shalom would rest on them. Lord, I ask you for escorts into your glory. Lord, I ask for a divine prompting, a divine help. Let the riches of his glory, the riches of your glory, would strengthen your people to offer the deepest parts of themselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's a privilege to be with you this morning. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your kindness towards me. Uh, Pastor Olin's a, a good brother in the Lord. He's been so kind. And I know enough of you in the congregation to know that sentiment runs through so many of you. I just, what a great feeling um, to experience the love of the body of Christ. So thank you so much. Bless you guys.